Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us this morning. Today's webinar is on investigations and compliance with the RTA. My name is Lynn Smith, and today our guest speaker is Stuart Taylor, the manager for our investigations team at the RTA. So welcome, Stuart. Thank you very much. In today's session, we're going to be looking at the differences between dispute resolution and investigations, the role of the RTA's investigations unit, the common investigation requests that the RTA receives, what actions can occur when we do receive an investigation request, information for the complainants, information for the respondents. We're also going to talk about what a penalty infringement notice is, and also to what you need to know about our prosecutions. So just to clarify in relation to a dispute request versus an investigations request at the RTA. So with dispute resolution, these are tenancy and bond disputes. They're in relation to the breach of a term of a tenancy agreement. So what we're looking at is whether there's a tenancy matter or whether that might be someone has claimed on a rental bond and someone disputes that. These matters um, will come through our dispute resolution service and go through conciliation at the RTA and then proceeds to QCAT. So these are usually the monetary um, types of matters. In relation to investigations, what we're looking at is these are investigations into the alleged offences of the Residential Tenancies and Rooming Accommodation Act, the penalty provisions of our legislation. They don't go to QCAT. These matters actually go to the Magistrates Court and this is what Stuart will be talking to you again today. So again, these are civil matters versus criminal matters. So over to you, Stuart, to talk about the role of the investigations team. <clears throat> Thanks, Lynn. So the role of the investigations team is to investigate alleged offences against the Act. Um, now, it's important to know that if an offence is committed, there are various types of appropriate action that we will take. And what we're trying to do there is to ensure that the offence is not repeated again. Now, we can only investigate offences if they are um, under the Act with having a penalty unit attached. So if you see the Act, you'll see there's sections that do have penalty units attached. Those are the offences that my investigations team can investigate. Now, we're independent. What I mean by that is uh, we act on behalf of the state. We take complaints from all parties and we do our investigations impartially. Uh, we do have uh, legislative powers to conduct um, certain uh, functions, such as requiring information. And an example of that is often we will request information from the bank in terms of bank records if we have a complaint that a bond hasn't been lodged. Okay, so Stuart, what I'm hearing is it's like a fact gathering process as well. Yes, that's right. So if you can soon identify an offence in the legislation, and that's where the um, what Stuart was talking about in relation to the penalty units. So this is just an example on the screen where we've circled um, in relation to where it says maximum penalty is 40 penalty units. So I'll get you to maybe just talk about the penalty units, Stuart. That's right. So the penalty units um, increase slightly every year, uh, June 30, July 1. The current penalty unit is $133.45. Uh, so as an example, under Section 116, which is a duty to pay a rental bond, um, the maximum amount, and I will stress maximum amount, uh, if the matter was to be prosecuted through the criminal courts for an individual, would be 40 times that penalty unit. So as it currently stands, uh, prosecution maximum amount would be $5,338. Now, for a corporation, it's five times that individual amount, and that falls under a different piece of legislation under the Penalties and Sentences Act. So you would times that, um, that 5,338 by five. So the maximum amount for a Section 116 due to pay rental bond that could be um, issued by the court uh, as a fine would be $26,690. And that's just for one non-lodgement or even a late lodgement of the bond? Yes, that's for an individual offence. Great. So with investigations, um, you receive investigations in a number of ways, Stuart. So I'll get you to step through. We've got three main types of ways that we seem to receive investigation requests. Yes, that's right. The main way that we receive our investigation requests um, is through referral from our client um, service centre. So uh, clients, be they tenants, agents, landlords or other support community groups um, will contact us and we will send them out an investigation request form. Uh, that can be obtained by contacting our call centre on 1300 
366311. We receive those investigation requests as our main um, main source of uh, invest investigations that come through. However, we do do proactive, proactive work um, as well here at the RTA. We're looking for trends um, that we see in the rental sector, uh, specifically in, in non-compliance. And if we identify um, sections within the uh, sector where there's non-compliance and potentially also in certain areas, then we will do a proactive investigation uh, in that area as well. And we will use the records that we hold here at the RTA to, to help us identify those trends. Uh, the third way that investigations commence is through our interagency referrals. Okay, so what sort of investigations would come through those agency referrals? Uh, well, typically we get a lot of referrals from the Office of Fair Trading. Um, that's because the Office of Fair Trading look after <clears throat> uh, trust accounts. Uh, so misappropriation of trust funds uh, quite often happens through non-lodgements of bonds and we will get a lot of referrals from the OFT and we do work collaboratively uh, with them in um, a lot of our investigations. We also do joint investigations and prosecutions with the uh, Queensland Police Service and commonly that will be because there may be a fraudulent um, element to the particular offence and we see that often in the 514 false misleading. Um, offences that we get. Uh, sometimes we refer those to the police or they may be referred um, to us. Uh, we also partner with um, the Queensland Fire and Emergency Services. Generally that will be um, overcrowding and rooming accommodation, smoke alarm compliance and we work in with the Department of Housing and Public Works, um, matters such as their boarding houses um, where the residential services um, are offered in the Residential Services Investigations Unit from the Department of Housing is another group that we work collaboratively with. So the type of action that can occur, so if a complaint <clears throat> is substantiated, then the RTA can provide education um, and engage with the parties to make sure that they're aware of their obligations. They can issue a caution letter, um, can also issue a penalty infringement notice, and we'll talk a little bit more on penalty infringement notices. Or they can also commence a criminal prosecution in the uh, magistrate's court. So just over to you, Stuart, in relation to what the difference is, is in relation to the options that is actually, or the action that can actually occur. That's right. We consider a, a, a wide variety of um, uh, different reasons when we look at the type of um, appropriate action that we take. I'd like to stress, however, that every case is considered uh, on an individual case-by-case -case basis. Uh, so this is just general information. Each case is unique and, and different and we judge each one individually. Um, however, as a general rule, what we're looking at is whether or not the other party was aware of what their legal obligations were in the first place and if they have still knowingly and deliberately committed an offence during that time, uh, whether or not that offence was part of a larger commercial or professional uh, enterprise as well. Um, and we also look at other factors as well. Once the uh, offence has been, or the alleged offence has been brought to the party's attention, uh, have they taken their own steps proactively to try and minimise the event happening again? Have they uh, amended any policies or procedures to try to mitigate that, uh, that um, event happening uh, in the future? We also have a look at um, whether or not there's been any similar offences committed in the past as well. Okay. So I'll just get you to talk um, a little bit more broadly with our, the most common types of investigations the RTA receives. And I have got a list up there um, in relation to most of the ones, but I'll get you to go through some. And if Stuart, if you've got some examples uh, that you can probably talk through about some of the examples of cases that's come through for some of these um, cases. Sure. Uh, so the most common uh, investigation request that we receive is around uh, non-lodgement of bond. It's also important to stress, however, it's not just non-lodgement, it's also a late lodgement of bond. Um, and if it's not lodged within the 10 days, what we will do is we have the um, option to investigate that matter. And in some cases, we have issued fines or even prosecuted uh, for late lodgement or non-lodgement of bonds. So it's important to make sure that bonds are lodged within the 10 days um, that's legislated. <clears throat> uh, we also look at unlawful entries and contracting out of the Act. A uh, good example of that, we had a large agency uh, with uh, a few unlawful entries and also one count of contracting out of the Act and that was for acquiring professional carpet cleaning. Um, now a conviction was recorded in that prosecution and that was due to some serious and aggravating circumstances in relation to the unlawful entries. Uh, which were quite repetitive in nature. Uh, that um, particular company was uh, fined 
uh, $10,000 for, for that matter. Um, we also investigate unlawful recovery of possession of properties. And by that, what I mean is uh, evicting uh, tenants unlawfully, uh, as well as quiet enjoyment and failure to give written agreements and entry condition reports. So quiet enjoyment covers a range of matters because what it does is it looks at the interference with the tenant's uh, reasonable peace, comfort or their privacy whilst using the premises. Uh, earlier this year, we prosecuted a private landlord for uh, an account of unlawful entry and quiet enjoyment. And that was an unusual case where this particular person cleared all the surrounding bushland on a large property after the tenants had moved in, um, provided no notice, nor was there any consent given. Uh, conviction was recorded and he was fined uh, $3,000 for that particular matter. Um, and again, talking around uh, quiet enjoyment, allowing tenants peace and, and privacy. Uh, we prosecuted another agency uh, recently uh, for quiet enjoyment, and that was in a case where uh, the agency refused to hand over keys to a property um, where the tenant had just signed uh, the agreement paid his bond and rent and they refused to hand over the keys unless every page of an entry condition report was uh, was signed prior to inspecting the property. Uh, now they received a $1,300 fine uh, for that particular conduct. Okay, so I think it's really, there's some valid points that you've raised in there, Stuart, is in relation to ensuring that your special terms that you put in your tenancy agreement are um, compliant with the legislation, that you're not contracting outside of the legislation. So again, changing timeframes, insisting someone has to purchase a particular supplies of goods and services, those types of things can potentially be looking at contracting outside the legislation. That's correct? Yes, absolutely. And one of the last examples that you gave was in relation to refusing um, to give the keys to the property unless the tenant signed every page of the entry condition report before they were able to view the property. Again, going back to our legislation, it's very clear in our Act under Section 65 about the entry condition report. It is a requirement that the lessor or the agent um, complete the entry condition report, they sign it, they then give a copy of the entry condition report to the tenant, then the tenant then has three days to complete that entry condition report and return it back to the lessor or the agent within that three day time frame. So again, enforcing someone to try and sign something without actually viewing the property or even following that legislation process, I can see then why they've actually received that fine for their conduct. So is there any other areas um, that's a concern that's coming to the attention of the investigation team, Stuart, that you're seeing? Yes, there's been a recent trend um, of quite large concern for us. Um, section 514 um, of our Act, now that section talks around providing false or misleading documents to the RTA. We seem to be seeing um, a fair bit more of this recently. Uh, examples that we've had is where uh, on the bond uh, refund form, after the tenants have signed, uh, agents uh, coming back and changing the amounts and then submitting it through um, our RTA process here. Uh, well, not only is that un unethical, it's also unlawful. It's an offence against that section. Um, we've recently uh, prosecuted one agency in regards to um, doing just that and they were fined uh, $2,000 in that particular case. Um, it's very important um, that at any stage, if there's a disagreement regarding the bond refund form, that what's signed is what is submitted um, to us here. At no time uh, can those amounts be changed um, without the knowledge and the consent of the other party. So it's very important um, to not submit those forms um, un unless both parties are aware of how much is being, being handed over to, um, to the RTA. So again, this is really another part to really be very mindful of for landlords and um, real estate agents that if you are also claiming a bond at the end of the tenancy, to make sure that you are only ever claiming the amount that you're entitled to claim. So we do get a lot of people that's um, claiming the whole bond where they're only really wanting just a portion of the bond. So again, making sure that un uh, the undisputed amount is released to the tenant. So as an example, if we hold, um, there's a $2,000 bond, you're looking to maybe claim a little bit of rent or some cleaning at the end. You may not necessarily have your invoices, but again, maybe just making sure that you claim only an estimate of what you're looking to claim. If you don't need that whole bond, you should not be claiming the whole bond. 
So just got a um, couple of questions just to clarify here too. The return of the entry condition report um, is three days. It's not business days for the tenant. It's just three days under our legislation. So I just want to just clarify that. So Stuart, just over to you in relation to the, if someone does complete an investigation request and, and lodges it with the RTA, um, obviously they need to make sure that the form is fully completed and signed, but what other information um, are, is your team looking for? Yes, it's really important when you complete the investigation request form that you provide all the relevant information, as much information as you can um, to assist us when we review the investigation and decide whether or not there is sufficient evidence for us to be able to investigate the matter. Uh, if in doubt, submit the submit whatever evidence you think we may or may not want. We are always happy to receive more rather than less. We will often come back to the complainants in the first instance um, requesting further information as well so that we can make an informed decision as to whether or not there is sufficient evidence for us to put the matter to the other party. Um, it's important as well to submit those forms uh, sooner rather than later because there is a statute of limitation uh, which does expire, uh, giving us a maximum of two years um, for us to be able to investigate a complaint. So once a party has decided that they do wish to make an investigation complaint, we do urge them to make it sooner rather than later and provide as much information as you can. If in doubt, um, submit uh, the extra information to us. Okay, so again, that really important for that time frame in sending an investigation request to us, not actually holding back because of that um, time frame that you have in relation to investigating the matter. Yes, that's right. We have two years uh, statute of limitations. Once those two years have expired, we, we can't take uh, enforcement action for the other party. So that two years is very important to us. Okay, so depending on the type of the matter and everything like that, there's obviously some more information that you may require um, from the complainant? Yep, that's right. Uh, so some of the further information that we require may be um, that you will need to, uh, if we look to prosecute the matter, we need to know that um, the parties that are making the complaint are wishing to provide a witness statement and if necessary, um, give that evidence in court as well. Um, we here at the RTA will always do our utmost to ensure that um, we put matters before the court for those that do need to go before the court, but ultimately um, we cannot provide uh, the information on behalf of the other party. So that party does need to um, be willing and able to attend court to provide that evidence um, if, if they're asked. Okay, so a lot of time is involved with those investigations and the prosecutions. So again, providing all that evidence and remembering that false and misleading information. Mm. Um, what should the um, complainant be aware of? Like they, they need to be keeping in contact with their investigating officer, is that right? That's right. Um, so the investigating officer will make contact with the complainant to let them know that they have received the investigation request and then letting them know which investigator is looking after the matter. It is important um, to keep in contact with the in investigating officer as the um, complaint progresses. Um, be that via email or via telephone. Um, it's also important, as you're stating as well, not to provide false or misleading information. That in itself um, can be an offence and it can also hamper an investigation as well if we become aware of it. Great. So again, this is also an opportunity just to remind people that investigations is not about claiming compensation or money. Um, this is about a breach um, in relation to the penalty provisions of the legislation. If there's a breach of the tenancy agreement and you're seeking monetary um, or seeking a bond matter, then this would actually go through our dispute resolution. Obviously, if someone hasn't lodged a bond, then that obviously then is still a um, investigation as well. So just in relation to, um, again, this is just a reminder that it's highly recommend to get your own independent legal advice for respondents and this is an opportunity for you to provide your side of the story and provide your evidence. Uh, yes, that's that's correct. The allegations letter that is sent out, uh, it's important to understand that uh, they're not QCAP matters, they're a, they're a different court. Uh, the criminal uh, prosecutions go through the magistrate's court, but they're not QCAP and there's different rules that apply uh, in that space. Uh, and there's also potentially uh, large uh, penalties that can be awarded against individuals or companies and potentially also convictions. Um, so it is important that 
those allegation letters, when they're received, that they're taken seriously and that there's an understanding uh, that it's not a QCAT process. So the letter of allegations um, that's provided is an opportunity for the other party um, to provide uh, their perspective as to what has occurred um, uh, during the event um, that has caused the other party to make a complaint. Uh, it's an opportunity to provide any relevant evidence um, to help my team make an informed decision as to uh, what, what has occurred. Um, however, I, I will uh, strongly state um, that because there are criminal matters, there is also uh, rights that all the parties have. Um, and the first is the, the right to silence. There is um, no obligation to um, uh, to take part in an interview or provide any information uh, to the investigations team. Uh, it's important at this stage as well, uh, when, I, when you read the allegation letter, you'll see there's a section where uh, the investigations team stress to seek independent legal advice. Um, in the past, a trend we've seen is that uh, real estate agents and uh, other parties have used um, uh, civil lawyers or conveyancing lawyers um, to handle um, their complaints. Um, now, whilst uh, we here at the RTA will never tell you who uh, you should engage as a lawyer, uh, there are, uh, what I will say is that there's um, specialists uh, that deal with uh, criminal charges um, and they are the criminal lawyers um, that are specialists in those fields. So uh, any party is, uh, is fine to use whichever specific uh, lawyer they feel comfortable with. Um, and again, it's an independent process, um, but be aware that there are specialists in that field um, that can deal with uh, criminal matters. Okay, so is there anything else there for like the respondents, maybe just to be aware of like, particularly when they are providing information to the um, RTA, particularly as part of that investigation process? Uh, yes, it is important that you don't provide uh, false and misleading information um, to the RTA. Um, as stated before, that is an offence um, under Section 514 to provide false and misleading information to the RTA. So uh, keep that in mind. The other important aspect as well is to make sure that the um, the principal, the, the company director or the owner is aware of the allegations letter uh, to have a policy or procedure in place where where that uh, individual is, is aware that an allegation has been sent uh, to the agency um, and not just the property manager. And the reason for that is that it affects the entire agency. Great. I'll just quickly just have a look. There's some questions coming through and unfortunately they're not really relating to today's topic. Um, so I'll just clarify, there's a lot in relation to the entry condition report and special terms and everything at the start of a tenancy and some paperwork questions. Um, so we actually did a webinar um, previously in relation to the start of the tenancy. So probably maybe getting everyone to actually go and have a, a review of the webinars actually available on our website, particularly in relation to the process about the entry condition report. Um, also to someone saying like if a tenant doesn't sign the bond lodgement form, I would probably recommend as best business practice still to lodge that bond with the RTA and just get them to say that the signatures will follow down the track as well. So just moving on in relation to the penalty infringement notice, Stuart, not a lot of people may be um, understanding what a penalty infringement notice is. Um, I always say it's very similar to a traffic or a speeding fine as such. So maybe just get you to um, expand on this process. Uh, yeah, that's that's correct. It is uh, very, very similar uh, to a, a traffic fine that you might receive. Uh, so penalty infringement notice, um, is it's 10 percent of the maximum penalty so before when we were talking around um, section 116 and we were saying it was five thousand three hundred and thirty eight dollars um, the maximum amount and it's always a set amount on the penalty infringement notices uh, is 10 percent so for the individual uh, as it currently stands it would only be five hundred and thirty three dollars uh, and eighty cents or for the corporation um, close to 2,700 and very similar to a traffic ticket there's options that you have if you do receive a penalty infringement notice. Firstly again um, make sure that the owner company director uh, is aware that the penalty infringement notice has been sent through. There's three options on there you do have the option to pay the fine in full you have the option to pay by instalments. The third option is that you can elect to contest the, the penalty infringement notice in court. So what that would mean is that uh, you tick the third box to say that you disagree that the offence has occurred and that you wish to contest the matter in court. And then we would commence a prosecution from our end where a complaint and summons is sent out to that individual to put the matter before the court. 
Okay, so there's options there in relation to paying the fine in full or arranging for the instalments or um, you can actually do that contesting of the, um, the PIN as well. Yes. Okay, and I know that you have actually touched on prosecutions before when we talked about like what the respondent has to do in relation to legal representation and so forth, but I might get you to just expand a little bit more on that prosecution side of things, Stuart, just so that everyone's fully aware that this is not QCAT and a couple of people have actually been sending some um, questions through in relation to the pins through QCAT and things like that. It's a very different process everyone. So QCAT is for your tenancy matters in relation to the breaches of the tenancy agreement, looking for warrant of possessions to end at the end of the tenancy and termination orders and things like that. This is a very different process. This is where our legislation, um, I think there's 568 sections of the Act and there's about 120 of those sections have penalty provisions in the legislation. So this is what our investigations team is looking at. If you have breached one of those penalty provisions of the Act um, and Stuart went through those common investigations before, non-lodgement or late lodgement of bond or that you, um, you know, contracting outside the legislation, those sort of actually have penalty provisions attached. And this is what Stuart's talking about today. And so over to you Stuart in relation to like the seriousness of the prosecutions. Yes, that's right. Um, it's, it's important to note that the investigations unit is entirely independent of um, QCAT and the QCAT process. Um, if a matter is put before uh, the courts uh, for a prosecution um, from the RTA, it is not QCAT. It is an entirely separate court. It's uh, still magistrate's court, but it's criminal court uh, and has absolutely no bearing whatsoever on QCAT. Um, it's also important that if a, um, a prosecution is, is commenced against an organisation that the person or the individual attending court um, needs to have the authority to bind the company. Now, usually that would be the director. Um, and we would always try to ensure um, that if a prosecution is commenced, that the director, the owner of the company um, is aware and also has the um, appropriate uh, uh, lawyer at court as well so that they're able to make the right submissions to the court and the reason we do that is um, there is the potential that a conviction could be recorded against the individual or the company and that does have very real ramifications down the track when it um, uh, licensing in the real estate industry there's also um, personal individual career and livelihood as well okay so just quickly just summarizing like what we've actually gone through this morning so this is about um, yeah, a breach of a tenancy agreement is a dispute process and not an investigation. So being very clear about that. Um, the investigations are going to relate to the penalty provisions of the legislation, so the Residential Tenancies and Rooming Accommodation Act 2008. There's timeframes to apply in lodging an investigation request. So again, for, um, for claimants who are putting in a request, that there is that time frame to allow making sure that our RTA investigations team can properly go through the processes that they need to go through. And again, also too for respondents, so responding to an allegation, it's advisable to seek that independent legal advice. And I think Stuart has also made very clear too in relation to seeking the appropriate um, legal representation to make sure that, um, I suppose one of the things that you've, I've often heard you say Stuart is that if you are, you wouldn't go to a criminal lawyer to do conveyancing. Would that be a fair comment to say? Exactly, yep. Yeah, so being very careful in relation to making sure that you do actually have the good representation that you need. And also the main thing is to just to comply with that legislation, um, you know, get to know the legislation um, and making sure that you all you know how to access that legislation. So just before we actually finish up here, I might just actually launch a um, poll just to um, gauge who actually is in our audience today, just before we keep going. We do have some questions here and also um, some themes that's coming through as well. So if I can just quickly just ask you, which group in the rental sector do you um, identify with in relation to whether you're a tenant, a property manager owner, um, community support or a landlord that actually owns their own property? So I'll just quickly get everyone, if you wouldn't mind, um, just getting you to complete that poll for me. Okay, so I'll just um, look at closing that in a moment. Looks like nearly everyone has actually completed that. So in today's session, we look like we have majority of about 74% of people attending today are actually property managers or agents or owners. 
Um, and we also have 9% for landlords and 10% um, for community support organisations. I'll just quickly um, just ask you one more poll. And what I'm looking for is what is your level of knowledge of the legislation? So in today's session, we're just looking at, um, you know, is there limited knowledge? Do you have fair knowledge? But I know where to get that information from. You have fairly good knowledge of the legislation. You're pretty confident that you know the legislation very well. Um, and if you're not quite fitting in any of those categories, then um, maybe just tick other. So I'll just leave that over for just one moment. And just while everyone's just doing that, again, we're getting a lot of questions in just not clarifying that difference between that QCAT and that um, magistrate type of situation, like the criminal and the civil. So Stuart, can I just maybe just, while well, we're just closing this poll, just get you to quickly just clarify that again for everyone? Yeah, so I think what's important to note is that if an RTA investigation is underway, it doesn't prohibit you from still continuing with your QCAT application, whatever it may be. Um, our process won't interfere with your Q QCAT process um, and they are independent of each other as, as well. So any RTA investigation can run um, conjointly along with whatever you're, uh, whatever you're before QCAT for. Um, there are times when references are made to investigations um, whilst uh, QCAT matters are being heard, um, but as a general rule, it's entirely independent um, and you, uh, you don't need to halt uh, any application that you have with QCAT pending a result from the investigations team. Great. So again, there is some themes coming through, Stuart, so I might just... Um you know, look, thanks everybody. I'm quite conscious that we are sort of like coming to a time and just remember the RTA is here to help. So if you have any tenancy or bond questions, please contact us. Um, our 1300 366 311 number and our friendly staff can um, assist you there. Or again, our RTA website has a lot of information available on it and there's a lot of information in relation to the investigation process as well as our dispute resolution process. So just clarification in relation to, and then you've just said that um, for the prosecution there, Stuart, that, you know, obviously to every case is on a case by case basis. So it's really important that people understand that in relation to how you actually make a decision, whether it's like a warning or the full prosecution. That's right, absolutely. It's a case by case basis. And um, we do look at the seriousness of the offence, what the level of harm was to each party, the likelihood that the offence is going to occur again, uh, whether the parties engaged in some behaviours as uh, some policy or procedure changes potentially to stop that behaviour happening again. We also look to whether or not it's in the public interest for us to take that enforcement action as well. And lastly, we need enough evidence. If, if we don't have enough evidence to um, have a reasonable belief of a prosecution, then we will not prosecute. Okay, so again, just explaining that time frame so that when someone does submit an investigation request, what is our time frame in finalising the case altogether? So we have an absolute maximum time frame of two years um, and that's legislated. So there is, uh, there's no discretion there, it is, it is two years. So what that means is get those investigation requests in. As soon as the decision is made that you wish to have the matter investigated, put the investigation request through it with as much information as you have at the time, as well as the fact that the sooner you lodge it, um, the fresher the, the, it is in your mind, the better your memory is going to be as to what occurred. Okay, and again, a lot of questions coming through. We've had a lot, quite a large audience today um, in relation to seeking like monetary situations and things like that. And again, it's just clarifying too, that is through our dispute resolution process. And again, our dispute resolution process is a confidential process. So if you're sending information through that process, it will stay in that process. And likewise, anything that's sent to our investigations team, it's that's confidential too. So that stays within our investigation area. That's a very good point. If you have gone through the dispute resolution process, the investigations team by law do not know the, the ins and outs of what happened during your dispute resolution process. Uh, there's confidentiality there. We are not informed as to what was said during that process. All we know in investigations is whether or not the resolution process was successful or not. So if you have told your story uh, to a dispute resolution team member, you will need to tell that story again to investigations. Okay. And just some questions in relation to the bond side of things. And there's been a very much a big theme about um, someone just asking, can I lodge mid and end of month for your bonds? Well, realistically, you may not be compliant with the legislation. 
The Act's been around for quite some time. It's very clear, lodge the bond within 10 days. Um, so it's probably best business practice to maybe choose one day a week to make sure that you are dispersing from your agency trust account and getting that bond in through that process. The RTA has launched recently um, an, the ability to lodge a single bond online through the digital process that we have available on our website. So that's an opportunity that is there. Um, and again, the RTA is still working through also creating more digital opportunities um, down the track for our forms. There's a good question here that's come through, Stuart, and I know that we have run out of time, but I think it's really relevant for our audience mm. um, today. And that is whether is, the, is it the property manager or the staff person that's taken to court, or is it the licensee or the company director that's going to be held responsible? Good question, uh, because we had one recently in court. So the company, the, the director, uh, there's vicarious liability. So what I mean by that is if the individual property manager for an agency does commit an offence, um, the agency themselves can be uh, brought before the court um, to answer that charge. Um, However, and what we had recently was that uh, exact scenario where the agency was brought before the court. However, the magistrate in their um, sentencing made it quite clear in their remarks that the offending really happened primarily by the, uh, by the agent, uh, the, the property manager uh, in this case. And as a result of that, uh, we went back and later charged that individual property manager as well, and they were also found guilty of that offence. Um, so either or all parties, and it is important to remember, uh, especially for the owners and directors out there, um, of that vicarious liability, and um, they can uh, have the company end up in court for the actions of an individual. Great. And just look, last question too, there's um, just explain to what can happen in that court process. So it's not just about a monetary fine, is it, Stuart? No, that's right. It's it's uh, it's not about the monetary fine as such. Uh, there are other um, issues that can arise for individual individuals or for companies. The first is that the magistrate um, can seek a conviction to be recorded. Uh, conviction recorded can have very real consequences uh, for a company in terms of um, their licensing and other matters as well. And if a conviction is recorded against uh, an individual, that can have very serious ramifications in your personal life um, as well. Great. Look, we have just gone over time. Thank you, everybody, for staying with us. Um, and again, thank you for attending today's webinar. A short survey is going to appear once I close the webinar, and we would really appreciate you completing this. This is also an opportunity for you to provide us with feedback on the topics you would like to know more about. So again, please just stay online um, for that survey to pop up as soon as I close the webinar. Again, thank you very much for attending today. Thank you very much, Stuart, for your time and the information that you've been able to share with our audience today. Thank you for having me.